wrong here? It says a huge right wing inside Labour. Oh. Labour split. Oh, absolutely. So Labour split down the middle in terms of um, left and right and liberal and conservative. So um, that would absolutely be the case. We couldn't get, yeah, it would be um, a big job to try to make it so it wasn't a conscious vote. And for as long as it's a conscious vote, we would have a real split in Labour. And um, less of a split, but um, we would we would lose most of National as well. I mean, it's just we just don't have the numbers. We don't have the numbers to get it through the Parliament as a parliamentary process. Um, that's the key. Um, and of course, you know, there's other games that are played. You might remember Craig McNair, who was um, a very young New, Z New Zealand First MP, he was only about 22, made a complaint to the police about Nandor's cannabis use. Um, that was very irritating, but it got some good, interesting press and um, made for some interesting law around the fact that you have to be able to identify a person's the actual time and place and sort of what they used in a very specific way before you could make a, a complaint that would go anywhere. But um, it's just, those are just part of the stupid political games that you have to put up with in the business. Um, next steps. In terms of the politics of cabinets, of cannabis, we've been in, I think the movement's been in a bit of a hiatus, um, but I think we might, it feels a bit like we're coming out of that a bit, and maybe it's the, it's the bus tour, I'm not sure, but there's, bit of a sense that we're getting a bit further, that some of the research that's coming out from Otago and from Canterbury is, is more rational and there's more of it, so there's a sort of sense of momentum about it. That means that the movement has got a huge um, opportunity, especially around eliminating the prejudice, and Paul talked about this, and I agree, that we have to stop people using cannabis as, and, you know, um, cannabis users, treating cannabis users as, as a um, as a second-class citizen, um, using um, pot-smoking lingo as um, pejorative terms, um, and hold people to account for what is just sheer bigotry and sheer prejudice that has no basis behind it other than that. And if we don't do it individually, it's not going to happen. Um, we've got the MedPOP bill, which is still sitting on the ballot paper, but it gives us a chance to have a different kind of discussion about cannabis, a political discussion that is about ethics, it's about compassion, <coughs> Um, takes it out of the personal interest and into a, a whole other realm. The Drug Foundation is running a series, um, basically a very long series, on having a cannabis conversation. Their view is that uh, there's been, there is no rational public discussion about cannabis at all and there needs to be one and so they've been doing various things to try to have that discussion. You can see stuff on their website if you want to contribute um, and they're producing papers and things in their magazine all the time trying to get um, the magazine called Matters of Substance, trying to get information out, get a discussion happening. The Law Commission, this is important, the Law Commission is doing a review of the Misuse of Drugs Act. Um, they want to have a look at a new legislative regime. Um, it's worthwhile noting that they're not going to talk about alcohol and tobacco um, as part of the new regime. So again, they're kind of keeping it split out. Eh? It's, that's, their, that's one of the things from their terms of reference. Yeah, like I've got their terms I, of reference. I've been thinking about this law commission review for ages, thinking yep. how it's going to be really good, but now I'm just reading that in the first sentence. Is, it makes proposals for a regime consistent with New Zealand's international obligations, yep. which automatically means it needs a new um, You don't forget, though, that, that the, the agreement that was signed however many years ago doesn't prevent us from having a, um, a decriminalisation regime. The international obligations we have don't stop us from doing that. They just, they, well, there's argument about that, I should so say. Six months warning. Ma yeah, I don't know what the details are, but I do know that there is a there is an assessment of the uh, international agreements that says that we don't. It doesn't prevent us from having a decrim. It just means that we have to have other kinds of um, policies around it. The question is, is what could that look like? Um, and so I, I, I agree, it looks concerning up there, but there is a whole other way of thinking about it. But basically, like, as long as we're signatories to the UN Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, we can't legalise. I, I think you're right, you probably couldn't legalise, but you could decriminalise, that's the argument. And there are people who will put that argument up. I know that that's some of the stuff Sally Caswell has been talking in her research, that it doesn't preclude 
a form of decriminalisation. Those UN agreements, um, the exact wording you use to deal with them is extremely important, extremely important. So the phrase partial prohibition is probably a very useful phrase for finding that wiggle room, um, whereas decriminalisation is not a phrase you would use. But th that might be why they talked about partial prohibition, because that was a, it gives them space um, to meet the agreement and to do other things. So there is room in this review for looking at that. I just don't know where Jeffrey Palmer is coming from with his perspective. I don't think there's any advantage. I don't think you would get you would have that would happen. So it's it would be stay, well, maybe not. But the the question is, where are you going to get the most leverage? And if and if you put energy into trying to remove New Zealand from the convention, then it could well be, I would suggest, a considerable waste of energy. That you'd be better off trying to exploit that grey area as much as possible, rather than trying to do something that would never happen. It just won't. I just my experience, anyway, it just wouldn't happen that they would withdraw from the convention at all. I mean, that's just not going to happen. Hey? I don't know how Holland gets away with it. Maybe they have a completely different community view about drugs. You've got to remember that. I mean, Paul's right. People don't actually give a shit about drug users here. In this country, we have this completely irrational view about cannabis. I actually was in the street today. I was walking past these two girls who were. Must have been talking about some party, and one of them said, "There's going to be smoking. There's going to be alcohol. There ain't going to be any drugs." <laughs> I was like, and she was talking to her friend. They walked past. I thought, I mean, you know, I just, I just couldn't really think much past that actually. That, but I mean, so, so where does where? It's, it's hard to know what to say about that. But that is the kind of attitude. It's like, what is the point? Until, um, I think, because that's where the. That's where another kind of it's a slow route, but that trying to shift people's view about drug users and drug use is really, really important. We're not going to be in the same position as Holland for a very long time. Neither are we going to, and we're not going to get convinced government to pull out of um, the convention, but we could convince them to exploit the space in between. <laughs> it is, but yeah, that's not. Well, that would have to be a discussion at the UN. I mean, that would have to be the the, the member countries would have to deal with that. No, it's not. You just and it does beg the question of why would you, why why would we as a, as a as a committed campaigners and activists on this choose to fight the the UN when we could actually make real gains here by concentrating on what we can change. I mean, if we get distracted, it's a distraction from what we can actually do, and then our energies are dissipated. Our ability to make change is, is screwed because we've just focused on something that's not but not the target. It seems like if we do all this stuff, then it's like the wiggle room. Then the UN will just tell us "fuck you" anyway and say that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what. I, but that's what. That's why. That's why we've got to find that where that wiggle room is, where they <laughs> won't do it. The government can make the changes. <sighs> And we get the benefit out in the end. There's, there is space in there. It's just finding it. Yeah, we, we can't change the UN, and we can't change the law in New Zealand either. But we can make a change by everybody smoking openly, and there'd be more people than the police could bust very quickly. Yep. It would become obvious how many dope smokers there were, and they couldn't bust them all. They yeah. wouldn't bust any of them. And, and the effort it will take to get every one of that 80% out on the same day, at the same time, to smoke a drink. Just smoke openly. That's what people do, yeah. Yeah, well, we've been doing yeah, that. Yeah, we're all sure. <laughs> because we're not going to change the law, are we? Well, no, we can. We can. We can change the law. We just have to...
plan for it, <laughs> I think. Um, this is the, just so you know, these are the terms of reference. So this gives you a sense of kind of what they're, what they're going to be dealing with. But it's quite a long document. You'll be able to find it on their website, which is on the slide before, um, so you could see. I'm just about 